and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in this episode, we're going to take a turn and we're going to look at some international issues. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion because it's something that's been fascinating me for a long time, is looking at arbitration in Hong Kong and in particular with respect to the Belt and Road Initiative. And for that topic, we have an exciting scholar, arbitrator, mediator in the Asian Pacific region, Professor Carrie Shang. Professor Shang is um, an assistant professor with the Business of Business Law at the California State Polytechnical Institute in California. She's also a mediator and arbitrator with the UDRP and she had been the chief representative of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, PRC office. So Carrie, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Amy, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, I'm a fan of your writing. You have done a lot of wonderful research in ODR and um, international distribution. So it's my great honor to be on your program today. Well, this is going to be great. Um, hopefully you can fill us in on lots of things um, to talk about. So first of all, I guess, um, just to kind of start the conversation, could you give us a little bit about trends and what's kind of happening with respect to arbitration in the Asian Pacific region, specifically looking at Hong Kong and China? Sure. Um, I think generally, um, parties are becoming a, a lot more interested in using arbitration as a primary way of resolving cross-border disputes in, um, in the Asia Pacific region and also particularly uh, in, in China where um, there are a lot of international um, things and trade and investment disputes are, are ongoing. So, so definitely I think there are a lot of also a lot of writings all the same but Asia Pacific is really becoming a new hub of international dispute resolution in particular arbitration to a less extent uh, mediation but, um, but those alternative ways of resolving disputes. So I think, so I think that's, how, the, that's a general observation. Uh -huh. So how, um, if you could explain a little bit of background and kind of get us up to speed on the Belt and Road Initiative and sort of the role that arbitration has in that initiative. So um, Belt and Road Initiative is basically um, a, um, a infrastructure financing project that was initiated by the Chinese government um, back in 2016 with the vision of uh, really building a kind of China-centric network, uh, like a new international governance order, but particular to serve a new international partners and allies of the Chinese government. So the Belt and Road is basically uh, it's a metaphor um, of the um, um, old Silk Road that China used to have a lot of very good partnership um, on, on country and with countries uh, along the old Silk Road. So Belt and Road is basically a new kind of metaphor of that kind of partnership China used to have. And basically what China has been doing um, with its Belt and Road initiative is really to fund projects in developing countries um, along the Belt and Road Initiative, in particular those in Africa, um, uh, Near East, and also the Middle East um, uh, with Chinese money, Chinese loan and funds. But um, because China, Chinese government has been funding this project, a very important part um, of this Belt and Road Initiative is that a lot of contracts that are signed. Mm -hmm. There are concession agreements or loan agreements, uh, and also because of the um, developing or kind of rule of law conditions in those countries are less than ideal so that um so chinese government has been artists anticipating that a lot of disputes are going to come up um, between chinese investors uh, and belt and road countries and also companies um, in the belt and road countries so so that is the general background of the belt and road initiative so it's a development financing project so then our most, so then the disputes, I mean, yeah, I would, I mean, of course, there's going to be lots of contracts, which means there will be lots of disputes. And then how does arbitration, so will all the disputes, is there automatically an arbitration clause built into these agreements or how do they structure arbitration within the agreements that are made? Is it automatic? Is it required by law or is it something contractual? 
So um, I, I, I work and also I interviewed a couple of um, 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 companies, especially those SOEs and state-owned enterprises that uh, had, that founded a lot of Belt and Road projects. And I think there's a push from the Chinese government to include um, arbitration clauses in their, in their contracts. So a lot of them are coming from pushes from the Chinese government and because Chinese companies or, uh, or financing those projects, so they have the money provided. So they have a lot of, uh, they have a, more advantages for the position um, so that it is very, it is easier, comparatively easier for China to push on the kind of dispute solution clause they want and also the, the kind of dispute solution venue they want. A lot of times they want to push um, using Hong Kong as a distribution venue. Sometimes Singapore, a lot of times Hong Kong, depending on Chinese bargaining power. Uh, if they're not able to um, get arbitration, sometimes they, um, they would like to stick with um, litigation. But with litigation, because Chinese government would also want disputes to be resolved within China, that would be a little bit even, even more difficult to get. A lot of times those contracts ending um, having arbitration clause inserted into them, which is kind of made of wrong. Right. Another kind of interest, and I know this is the arbitration conversation, but it does, does kind of flow in. You know, how about the Singapore Convention? Will that have any applicability? Will that sort of come into play at all and maybe think about mediation in some of these disputes? Right. I think China has been quite active in trying to push mediation for, for many years because mediation um, sounds more like less uh, um, 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 controversial. So basically it, it fits more with the Chinese harmony kind of social construction. Um, and China was among um, the first batch of countries that, uh, that actually endorsed Singapore Convention. Um, but um, but the, the push towards mediation, although there are a lot, I don't think it's particularly easy. There are, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, um, commercial mediation or investment mediation is something that's really very new to China. China used to have this, um, so China has this people's mediation law, which allows judicial mediation and community mediation. But community mediation is basically just uh, this kind of people's mediators that are, commu uh, that are, that are mediating family, divorce, kind of disputes without a fee. So it, 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 it has been set, mentioned explicitly in the act that mediation in China, community mediation in China is for free. So um, you cannot charge anything. So basically there has been this kind of lacking of talent of commercial mediators in China, or commercial mediators with this kind of exposure to um, international um, disputes. So I think that's that's one reason mediation has been quite hard to um, to push, given that China wants mediation, and also um, also because a lot of build and road uh, contracts were signed before Singapore mediation came into play. So I think that also has impacted um, the willingness to use mediation. So I, I think probably there's you're going to see more escalated clause or integrated way of resolving disputes. Currently, um, it's majority of them would, would probably are going to be resolved through arbitration, not mediation, I would say. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting though, but that makes perfect sense, right? So most of the mediators, if they're gonna be community mediators doing family and community issues, it's very different from being a commercial mediator who expects a fee in, in a totally different type of structure. So that's really interesting, great point. Right. You know, but yeah, so when I was heading the ADR practice of the Hong Kong International Trade Desk, I was, I was in charge of mediation practice. Um, even, even though in Hong Kong where um, you do see like a traditional commercial mediation, it's still kind of um, hard to um, have commercial mediators sitting on very big cases just because there are a lot of pushes from law firms because law firms, in a way, they hate mediation <laughs> because that takes a lot of money away from them. So that's it's probably another explanation. Right, you don't want to cut down their billable hours, right? Yeah. Well, so that, I mean, but talking about costs, right, and thinking about, I mean, Hong Kong has traditionally been a hub, really, uh, for a lot of arbitration, commercial arbitration, and and sort of thinking about that. Do you see, especially with the pandemic, um, more use of technology in arbitration as well, which of course cuts down on costs if you don't have to travel and all the rest. Um, have you seen that for yourself or, or what have you seen or heard? So definitely. So um, so I have, I have the figures from both uh, from Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, uh, which has started uh, this uh, virtual hearing kind of um, e-arbitration um, since February because the pandemic hit the Asia region a little bit earlier. 
Um, and and um, um, so uh, my source from Hong Kong International Trade Center told me that they have uh, administered 40 virtual hearings um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So definitely there are a lot of pushes of using uh, internet-based video conferencing technique of uh, conducting arbitration. Um, so I think by technology, a lot of the a lot of technology we're talking about in arbitration in Hong Kong are still um, something that concerning uh, virtual hearings. So what kind of platforms they're using, uh, what kind of uh, encryption and techniques or um, online um, repositories for storing those documents in arbitration. So I think those are technologies, but are they very advanced technologies? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I am probably not as advanced as we um, we want it. Um, a particular interesting development in Hong Kong is there's a new um, platform that's called eBrand, which is an important um, uh, government initiative that is pushed very hard by the Hong Kong DOJ, which is the Hong Kong Department um, of Justice. So eBrand is um, what they call a integrated dispute resolution forum that is specifically targeting ground and road disputes. But it's not very clear what this platform is really about. But but according to um, information given by the government, it's going to um, um, incorporate uh, mediation, arbitration, negotiation, uh, and it, it, it will accommodate a lot of user technologies such as um, automated like text textual analysis, blockchain enabled authentication, machine learning, things like that. But with the um, political situation there um, and also the COVID, I think that project has been delayed. Um, but, uh, but that's something to watch for if you're interested in, in knowing more about technology uh, lab um, um, distribution chain in the region. Oh, yeah, 100%. I'm going to be watching that for sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really interesting to me. So, um, you know, I guess um, finally, um, you know, we have to ask the question is um, the current relationship with um, the PRC and Hong Kong. Do you see that um, at all impacting arbitration? Um, how do you think that matters with respect to, especially with Hong Kong being a very popular place for commercial arbitrations? Right. Um, I, I think we would have to um, admit that it's gonna impact Hong Kong. So there's no way to deny that. I mean, a lot of, I mean, a lot of very like pro Hong Kong people are saying that Hong Kong has this strong rule of law. It has very pro arbitration course. And I think it's gonna change, which is not right because based on people's perception, things have changed. But I think uh, even with um, uh, the couple of years I work in Hong Kong, um, I think Hong Kong started to have um, a lot more cases involving China. So, so with the same number of arbitration cases, let's see before, uh, the Hong Kong International Mission Center had about 30, 100, um, 300 cases per year. Maybe half of them are international cases, half of them are China related cases, but now, um, the, the percentage of China included, uh, related cases um, has been increasing. So um, I think it's likely that Hong Kong is going to become a more China serving this resolution center, even though I don't know how it's going to impact the total case, but I think probably it's going to become um, a, a, a hub that featuring more cases involving Chinese parties, while um, those non-China cases in the region, um, uh, in, in the region, a lot of those cases might go to Singapore or other um, seemingly more neutral venues. So I think it's gonna impact Hong Kong. Um, even, even, even it might not impact the total number, it might um, impact the compensation of cases there. Right, right. Well, gosh, I have to say um, thank you for taking this time with us today. I really appreciate it. I know you're very busy. Um, getting ready for classes and all the rest of it. So thank you so much for taking the time, really good insights and great information. So thank you very, very much. Thanks so much, Amy, my pleasure.